We're heading into the Thanksgiving uh, holiday week. And next to Christmas, this holiday is the most celebrated one of the year. Maybe Halloween comes in there, but that's not really a holiday, is it, Halloween? In a lot of ways, Thanksgiving is probably um, affects more people because it's, it's, not a, it's not a religious holiday, if you wish, uh, in, in nature. And the spirit of it can be appreciated by all people, regardless of their faith. You know, someone who's a Hindu can appreciate what uh, he or she has. Someone who has no faith at all can simply have a moment of appreciation for what, uh, what uh, he uh, possesses. Uh, another thing that's interesting about Thanksgiving is that um, um, uh, this holiday is uniquely American. Uniquely American because Americans can easily relate to both concepts included in Thanksgiving. In the USA, there is much to be thankful for. And in the USA, giving is possible because there is an abundance. In Haiti, for example, they don't celebrate Thanksgiving. That holiday doesn't exist in Haiti because when the mainstay of your diet is thin milk and pieces of bread or small pieces of meat in rice once every couple of days, there's not a whole lot to celebrate. There's not a whole lot to exult in, in giving thanks. And if you're the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere, you're usually on the receiving end of charity, not on the giving end of charity. Now, I don't I don't say these things you know, to make us feel guilty or to you know, spoil the holiday, but rather to make us aware of the fact that Thanksgiving is a holiday well suited to this country because of its special blessings. And so with this idea in mind, I'd like to review from a biblical perspective the two main ideas contained in Thanksgiving, thanks and giving. Perhaps if we get beyond the turkey you know, and the day off from work and the football and so on and so forth and really understand these terms, thanks and giving, perhaps the holiday may become, um, hmm, may ring truer to us, for us, in our hearts and in our, in our spirits. So there are different kind of thanks uh, when we give thanks. One is we give thanks as self-awareness. See the idea? We give thanks as self-awareness. You know, I believe more prayers are said on Thanksgiving Day than at any other time of the year. People who don't normally pray or have any kind of religious life will usually pause and acknowledge their blessings and good fortune on this day. People who don't usually say grace when they take a meal will not be embarrassed to return thanks according to the custom of this day. For many people, this is the only day they ever say thanks before they eat. And people who are faithful Christians and who always pray at mealtime will especially take the time to offer grace on this special, on this special day. And I'd add one other category, you know, if you always give thanks, but your family, you know, your, your extended family are not believers, they're not religious people, this is the one day of the year where, they, where they'll cut you some slack to say thanks and include everybody in the meal. I remember in my family what would happen, you know, someone would say, oh, go ahead and say your little prayer there. You know. <laughs> go ahead and say your little prayer now, Thanksgiving. You know. So it was at least the one day that, that allowed me to just, you know, Give thanks for everybody in the room without fighting me on it. I think that sooner or later, you know, a person realizes that this is a pretty wonderful country with so many advantages and prosperity that thanking God becomes an obvious necessity. Like, I'm embarrassed that I'm not saying thanks. To offer thanks is a way of acknowledging that this is the United States of America. It's not Haiti. It's not North Korea. That this place is special and life, despite the turmoil and all the politics and stuff like that, that life here is pretty good, pretty good. 
thanks for blessings is a way of confirming that we are not blind to the prosperity that we enjoy. It is the collective expression of self-awareness concerning our blessed condition. We recognize that we are really blessed and at least one time of year, most people will acknowledge this reality. Thanks says we know we are well off. We see other nations, we see other people, and we see very clearly our advantage and we appreciate it. Thanks as self-awareness. Then there's thanks as self-protection. Not self-awareness, self-protection. You know, no one likes a person who is an ingrate. You know, you do something for them and they don't appreciate it, they don't acknowledge it, they don't thank you for it. It's not that you're doing it to get thanks, but it grates when you go out of your way to help somebody and they just blow it off. You know, it's like you're supposed to do that. Everyone appreciates being appreciated. You know, God is more gracious than we are. The Bible says that He sends the rain on the just and on the unjust, Matthew 5, 45. God is able to bless even those people who don't acknowledge that the blessings come from Him. God still blesses the ones that don't thank Him. However, the day will come when God will hold all persons accountable for their actions, good or bad, whether they acknowledge and thanked Him or not. In Romans 2.16, Paul says, God shall judge the secrets of men. In Hebrews 10.30, the writer says, the Lord shall judge His people. It's a pretty sure thing in the Bible that God is going to judge everybody. Sometimes God judges His people in this life by removing their blessings and removing their advantages. You know, the Jewish nation lost their privileges when they failed to acknowledge God and His word. They were destroyed, they were scattered more than once. The pagan king Nebuchadnezzar lost his throne and his sanity. Why? Because he refused to give God the credit for his military and political success. In all cases, God will judge our response to His blessings and our use of our blessings when Jesus returns. In Matthew 25, 31, you know the great scene, the great judgment scene? Did we clothe the naked? Did we feed the hungry, feed the hungry, visit the imprisoned, so on and so forth? Did we do those things? There'll be a judgment based on the things that we did, the things that we said. In Psalm 127, 1, the psalm says, unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. So the best, protect my point, if you're wondering, the very best protection for the blessings that we have, the surest guarantees for continued prosperity are not safety deposit boxes or strong armies. To preserve our blessings, we need to acknowledge and thank the one who provides them in the first place. And so there is thanks as self-awareness and then thanks as self-protection. And then there's also thanks as self-edification. Thanks as self-edification. I want to read, open your Bibles please, to Psalm 92. You know, a lot of preachers, uh, ministers, whatever, they say, oh, I'm going to read you my favorite psalm, my favorite psalm, my favorite passage. This is my favorite psalm. It has been for a long, long time. I love this psalm. Psalm 92, thanks as self-edification. Psalm 92 says, it is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness by night. With the ten-string lute and with the harp, with resounding music upon the lyre, for you, O Lord, have made me glad by what you have done. I will sing for joy at the works of your hands. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. A senseless man has no knowledge, nor does a stupid man understand this that when the wicked sprouted up like grass and all who did iniquity flourished, it was only that they might be destroyed forevermore. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. 
For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies will perish. All who do iniquity will be scattered. But you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil and my eye has looked exultantly upon my foes. My ears hear of the evildoers who rise up against me. The righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and very green to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in Him. You know, some people think that giving thanks is a one-way action, that we thank and God receives our gratitude because that makes Him feel good. I'm going to make God feel good today. I'm going to give thanks. But you know what? God doesn't need, need, He doesn't need anything. And the reason that our thanks pleases Him is because this action provides Him a way of blessing us in yet another way. You see, sin and death cause us to experience all kinds of things. Sorrow, pain, guilt, fear, shame, anger, depression, discouragement, so on and so forth. None of these things are pleasant. Now other type of things cause us to experience pleasant and joyful experiences. For example, faith in Christ causes us to feel you actually feel it. It's not some sort of theological idea, some esoteric idea out there that you can't touch. Faith in Christ causes us to feel hope, causes us to feel secure, causes us to actually feel happiness, to experience enthusiasm. Forgiveness, for example, causes us to feel peace. Relief, I am so relieved that my sins are forgiven. I am so relieved that I will not be subject to condemnation. I can actually feel that relief. Knowledge of God's word causes us to feel zealous, bold, secure, happy, mature, wise. I was listening, we, hopefully all of us were listening this morning to Marty and I saw what was happening to Marty. Being a preacher, I recognize it. The sermon got away from him. <laughs> he was in control, but then he started to preach the gospel and then the gospel lifted him up and he got excited. And he, he, it got away from him. It's like you're, riding a, or like you're riding a bike and you're going fast and all of a sudden your feet, you know, you, the pedals are going round and round but your feet can't catch them. That's what was happening. He got excited about the gospel and about the possibility and what can happen when everybody's preaching and everybody's sharing. He was feeling something. The messenger was feeling excited. Well, in the same way, the giving of thanks makes us feel joyful, complete, it makes us feel closer to God. The giving of thanks gives closure to our feelings of appreciation. Something wonderful has happened to us, something wonderful has been given to us. We see the blessings that we have and the giving of thanks enables us to have emotional closure because of that experience. So many people in the world who are not believers but who have been blessed with riches or wealth or fame or, 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 or skill or whatever, so many of them continue to be depressed, so many of them be, you know, they continue to be unhappy, unsatisfied. Why? There's no closure to their blessings. Why? Because they don't give thanks to God. The only way to tie it up emotionally is to give thanks to God for what we have. Otherwise, you know what happens? 
I feel guilty. Why should I have food? All the food that I can eat, all the food anytime, any type of food at any time, as much as I want, I can have it. That would make me feel guilty because at the same time that I have that blessing, I recognize that someone else in Haiti who's just as much a believer as me, he's eating rice with a little bit of meat in it and some thin milk, or he's eating only once a day. How can I sleep knowing that there are other people who are starving in the world and I have more food? I have to throw food away, can you imagine? The bacon didn't, you know, went bad in the, in the freezer, in the fridge, oh, I'll just take it and throw it away and buy some more. How could I sleep at night knowing all that I have, knowing that so many in the world don't have? How can I sleep at night? I say thank you. Thank you, God, for what you've given me. That brings me closure emotionally. That's why Thanksgiving is, is so important. Giving of thanks helps us deal with our wealth without feeling guilty. It gives us a sense of closure in that we know where our blessings come from and do what is right concerning our blessings. Focusing on thanks helps lift depression because it allows us to get a proper balance between all that we have in contrast to what we don't have. You know, my favorite psalm, as I say, 92, which we just read, it's my favorite because the author explains that the giving of thanks should be an attitude of the heart that lasts from morning until night, from youth to old age. As a matter of fact, he suggests that this attitude is the secret for staying physically and mentally healthy into old age. God wants us to thank because it makes us feel good, not Him feel good. He rejoices for us as we learn the sweet experience that comes from thanking Him. And so thanks and giving, some aspects of the idea of thanks. A couple of aspects of as far as giving is concerned. The true purpose of this holiday, of course, is to give thanks. That's why it's called thanksgiving. That's what we give. We already discussed some of the elements involved in the giving of thanks. Giving of thanks a road to self-awareness. Giving of thanks a form of self-protection. Giving of thanks a good way of self-edification. But thanksgiving is incomplete if all we do is recognize our blessings in the giving of thanks. Since thanksgiving helps us recognize the generous nature of God's giving, I think it should be a time when we consider the nature and quality of our own giving as well. In other words, when I reflect at thanksgiving on what I have received, I should also reflect at that time on what I give. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul the Apostle reviews rather, with the Corinthians the true nature and style of Christian giving. And if you have your Bibles, go there. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning in verse 3, he says, For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own Accord. He's talking about another church there that was helping others in the brotherhood. Begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. So notice the nature and the true style of Christian giving. First of all, Paul says, before you give anything, you must first give yourself to the Lord. Your giving can only bring joy and satisfaction if it stems from the fact that you have submitted yourself totally to the Lord or in the process of giving yourself totally to the Lord. Nobody gives themselves all at once to the Lord. 
Who does that? Who can do that? But you know, every time, every time someone asks you to step forward a little bit, serve a little bit, how about giving up that bad habit a little bit? How about beginning to work on this? How about improving that skill? How about serving the church in a particular way that you haven't before? Those are all steps in the giving of myself to the Lord. Many people don't enjoy giving and they don't give generously because their heart is just not into it. Their heart's into the world, not into the Lord. If your heart truly belongs to the Lord, your money, your time, your effort will easily find its way into the proper place in the service to the church. Another thing he talks about is attitude. It's attitude, not amount. Note the attitude of these Macedonian churches in giving to the poor described by Paul. He says, they were willing to give. They were enthusiastic in their giving. They gave beyond their means. In verse 12, if you go down chapter eight, verse 12, skip down, it says, for if the readiness is present, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he doesn't have. In other words, if the attitude about giving is right, the amount given will be right according to that person's ability. When the attitude is right, the money given or the service given becomes simply an expression of faith and love and confidence, especially confidence. If I give this to you, Lord, I know that you will provide for me what I've taken away from myself to give to you whatever that is. If I am asked to give money, I know that you will provide money so that I can continue on. If I'm asked to give time, I know that you will give me time or you will enable me to use my time in such a way that I will be able to continue and do what I need to do. When the attitude is right, the money given becomes an expression of faith and love and as I said, of confidence. And he says that giving is a way to demonstrate true fellowship. In chapter eight, again, in verse 12, and I'll read 13, he says, for if the readiness is present, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For this is not for the ease of others and for your affliction, but by way of equality. And then skip down to verse 24, he says, therefore openly before the churches, show them the proof of your love and of our reason for boasting about you. The way to develop true and sincere fellowship is by developing generous giving. You see, the ones that have the blessings and the wealth need to share because it helps them maintain their faith. Well, wait a minute, you mean giving helps me to maintain my faith? Sure it does. Because we know that wealth leads to worldliness and ease leads to carelessness. And prosperity many times leads to callousness about the plight of others. The, the danger of wealth is that it, 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 it um, it closes, us, it closes us off from those who are needy. We can be in our air-conditioned bubbles you know, and just walk around and, and not feel or, or experience the need of other people because we have enough wealth to insulate. That's the word I was looking for. We have enough wealth to insulate us against the problems and the, and, and the needs and, and the suffering of other people. Why, why do you think we, we build high walls around our communities? Only one way in and one way out. And some communities have gates. Why do we do that? We want to insulate ourselves against the problems of the world. The wealthy, and in the world, by the way, that's us in the United States, we're the wealthy. The wealthy need to give to express their love and concern for their brethren and our own dependence on God to provide for our giving. 
The poor, the needy, they need to receive because otherwise they will lose hope and without hope their faith will collapse. Not only will they have a miserable life here, if their faith goes, they face the prospect of no life with God after this miserable life. Think about it, I mentioned Haiti because I've been there and so many of you have too. Your whole life you suffer in this miserable country, a miserable life, and if on top of that nobody brings Christ to you, you have misery forevermore. While here in the United States, I have food and shelter and wealth and comfort and I'm going to heaven. You see the, you see the disparity there? In the first century, Paul was able to create fellowship between the Jews and the Gentiles, how? By dialogue? By having a committee? No. No, he created fellowship between the Jews and the Gentiles through the giving of the Gentiles to the starving Jews in Jerusalem. That's how he created fellowship between these two groups, or the beginning of it anyways. We know the gospel is what brings us together and we're one in Christ, but the practical bringing of these people together to, to deal with each other. The Gentiles had money, the Jews were starving, so he took the money from the Gentiles and he brought it to the Jews and, and created there a fellowship of need. Nothing demonstrates that we share the same faith and hope with others as when we share our worldly goods with others to keep their faith strong or to bring them at least the knowledge of the gospel of Christ. So I hope we're going to take advantage of the double blessing available to us at this time of year. Hey, enjoy the blessings, enjoy the prosperity, that we have with our family, with our friends, in our homes. And enjoy the particular benefits of both recognizing and thanking our gracious Lord who has provided these gifts, not only for this week, He provides it for every single day of our lives. I ask all of you, when was the last time you skipped a meal? And I hope also that this enjoyment will sharpen our sense of giving as we approach this special time of the year. You know, uh, this morning we uh, talked about uh, Brown Bag Christmas, not the only benevolence project that we have in, the, uh, in our congregation, but it's the one that we do at this time of year. We, um, you know, we collect bags of groceries and we fill them up with groceries, Christmas things, cards, you know, just stuff. Uh, to bring a moment of joy to a family that perhaps is in need of the basics, food, some candy for the kids, a toy, maybe even a voucher, you know, $20 voucher so they can have fresh milk and bread and things like ice cream, you know, something. And in that bag we also put in a, you know, a flyer that talks about the Church of Christ and maybe one of our little books there, you know, uh, a Christianity for Beginners or a DVD or something to tell them this is, this is with love from Choctaw. We don't know you, but we have heard of your plight and we want the love of Christ to demonstrate our caring for you, to feed your stomach, to give you a moment of joy and at least give you the opportunity to hear the gospel or to know where the gospel, the gospel is being preached. I hope that you'll, I didn't preach this sermon to make this point, but they, it kind of comes together. I hope that when we talk about that and we encourage everybody to bring their bags in, please do so, participate enthusiastically because everything that you will be giving, everything that we will be giving, will be going to people who really need it. And the twist this year, as I mentioned this morning, is that we've contacted smaller churches in our area that don't have a program like this, who are poorer than we are, just like in the Bible, <laughs> they were helping each other. 
And we've said to these churches, tell us who needs something like this in your congregation and we will provide. We're, we're a larger church, we're a, a wealthier church, we have more resources than these smaller groups. We're happy to do it and we extend the right hand of fellowship to you. How? By having a, a meeting between the two preachers? No. We, we extend to you the right hand of fellowship by offering to you our abundance that you can serve the people in your congregation with some of the abundance that we're able to have in our congregation. I hope that you'll participate in the Brown Bag Christmas project in the weeks to come with that idea in mind. At this time also, of course, we have an opportunity to make other statements before God and His church other than one of benevolence. Perhaps an initial statement of faith in Jesus Christ expressed in repentance and baptism, if you haven't already done that. Perhaps a confirming statement of faith in Jesus in case that we've fallen away from Him or we've been unfaithful. We do this through repentance and prayer. Perhaps a public statement that we as Christians want to be recognized as members of this local congregation and recognize the leadership of our elders over the welfare of your souls and the souls in your family. Or perhaps a statement of need for emotional or physical or spiritual assistance from the church because we want to be the church that visits the sick, that sees the ones who are in prison, that provides the clothes, that provides the food. And the, we want to be that church. But many times we don't know where to serve because we're not informed of the needs. So if you have a need, this is a good time to do that as well. Whatever statement that you may need to make at this time, we've set aside this moment for you to be heard, to be ministered to. So we encourage you to make a response as we stand and as we sing our, our song of invitation. <clears throat> 